morning. How are, how are you? Just driven past the paper shop again. I've, um, we normally provide the, uh, actually we used to provide the Times and the Guardian and then we changed over to the Telegraph and the Guardian and then uh, it's costing about £3 a day, £15 a week, which is not a massive amount. I used to take it out of petty cash, but uh, I've knocked it on the head for a few weeks because um, what I'm doing instead is I'm on this massive drive to run on time. So someone's due in at uh, 9.15, then we see them on the dot of 9.15, and so it sort of reduces their requirement to sit in the, in the waiting room reading because they're being, you know, I mean, it's nice to provide something like papers for people, but uh, I'm not going to lose sight of the fact that the bottom line, really, for any sort of reading material in a dentist's waiting room is because you're being kept waiting and uh, the dentist wants to try and mollify you a bit because uh, uh, you're, uh, you're being disrespected. So, anyway, uh, we'll see how it goes. I mean, it's another £500 a year, £600 a year, isn't it? And, We'll put them back again as soon. I mean, well, I also the other reason I stopped them was because of this. Uh, oh my God! There's a highway maintenance van that's just stopped right bang on the worst right-angled bend on the entire trip. What does he think he's up to? Yeah, so we had we had a sort of a short month, didn't we, courtesy of the General Dental Council, but. Um, Funnily enough, it's turned out to be our best month. <laughs> it's our best month for six months, January, and uh, I didn't even start work till the 17th. So I don't know what that tells you. I mean, you know, I'll have to compare it to last January and see if last January was good as well. Or whether it's because I've been more inclined to work hard and do a load of fee paying work, or, you know, because I was more worried than normal. I mean, you don't know, do you? Anyway, still not, I mean, you know, we're not rolling in money. Having just paid the wages yesterday, I can say we're definitely not rolling in money. We've got, I use QuickBooks to do our internal management accounts, but it never agrees with anything. It never agrees with the accounts that my accountant presents, and he never bothers to modify my QuickBooks so that the QuickBooks does agree with the accounts that he presents. And uh, it never ever agrees with the PAYE records that in Inland Revenue maintain online. And the pensions are a classic example of that. I don't know whether you've started paying pensions yet, but our staging date was the 1st of November, and so um, you know, then you have to type a bit of information into the uh, QuickBooks, and then it starts telling you how much uh, you know what you're supposed to contribute, and the contributions don't match, they're nothing like. Uh, what the, I mean, when I say they're nothing like, I mean like there might be, Inland Revenue might say 17 pounds and QuickBook might say 23 or 14 or something. So, so I just, you know, these little in our errors, these inaccuracies, you just have to let them ride. I'll let the accountant worry about those if the Inland Revenue is gonna come round and start worrying about three quid more or less. The main thing is that you know you type in the amounts correctly into the pensions website and it then works out how much you're supposed to pay and then that's what gets direct debited so the correct pension payments are are made what's the error comes in with when your internal payroll um, might uh, not withhold enough in other words when you come to pay the person because the pension amount on their payslip doesn't match what you've, the practices had deducted, you might have uh, given them three pounds too much or withheld three pounds too much or something. So I've told them if they can't understand how to administer it, I don't see why I'm gonna be able to. I mean, it's gonna be, what, well, about 20, 30 quid at the end of the year per member of staff. I mean, that'll have to be sorted out retrospectively. I'm sorry, I can't. I'm not going to say it. I'm not going to say it after work at like half past five at night and try and work out why Great Books and the and the Revenue don't agree by three pounds. I'm just not going to do it. I, I send me to jail. I don't care. 
that, that's a pattern really, you know, when we set the surgery up, we were, I think we were a bit late with, there was some confusion over when payments were due because uh, in the past, uh, I, when I've, you know, the payroll's been quite large, you, I've made monthly payments. And when it's much smaller, like with only three employees, you can actually make quarterly payments. And then the problem with quarterly payments is, when is it? When is the quarterly payment due? Is it this month, or did we make it last month, or is it next month, or the month after that? You know, you sort of lose track. And so then the Inland Revenue says, uh, we're going to uh, pop around and see you and have a chat. So I'm like, all right, fair enough. And then this woman comes around and says, uh, you know, what's going on? You know, you haven't paid. And they've got these three questions, which are just like, do you understand that you have to pay? Uh, do you have the resources to pay? And will you pay? <laughs> That's all they want to know. And I said to her, the reason, uh, actually part of the reason was the fact that we, we couldn't reconcile what the Inland Revenue was telling us we, we owed with what the uh, QuickBooks, which is supposed to have a payroll system on it, was telling us that we were due to pay. And I said to her, we, um, you know, we can't reconcile these things. In the old days, it was all done from a book and you could put everything, all the bits of paper out on the floor and just work it all out. But nowadays, the, the, these payroll systems are so tightly integrated to the Inland Revenue and I think it's a big mistake. I think it's a huge mistake. I think they they think that they can micromanage everything and, and tie everything up, you know, join everything up and get, uh, you know, because you can't now, for example, I couldn't pay the staff in January until I've done the payroll in December. And doing the payroll in December includes making a declaration to the internet revenue about who I paid, how much I paid and, you know, and then until you've done that, they won't let you do the January payroll. So, God help you if you've got a problem, you know, you've got 30 days to sort it out or you can't pay the staff. And then every time you send in a, a thing, it says, oh, this submission is late. Even if, even if my payday is the 31st of January and I, I do the payroll like I did yesterday and I send in it, it says, yeah, thank you for your late submission. I'm, I'm like, and you give up. And I said to her, this is the problem, is we can't reconcile them. She said, well, she said, we're only using the data you send us. She said, you're, you know, I don't, you can't use that argument. She's like, oh, you can't use that argument because we, you're the one providing the data that we use. So you can't say you can't reconcile it. And I'm like, yeah, well, actually, but I don't actually send you that. What I do is I just type in what I pay the staff. I press a button, there's some whirring and clanking and a bit of steam comes out the back of the computer and it sends the figures off to you and then you write to me and say, it's all wrong. <laughs> and I don't have the means, I don't have the levers, I can't get inside the computers thinking to try and work out where it's gone wrong, what it's done wrong. It's all done in the background now, you know, it's all done behind the scenes. So, and I honestly, I've given up trying to uh, do that. I think we've, we've reached the point now of maximum payroll where with this pension malarkey, you're just, we've reached the point where the average businessman cannot run a payroll. You know, the average small businessman cannot run a payroll because you're dealing with so many, too many government agencies, you're dealing with too many taxes. You know, I'm not just talking about hourly pay and holiday pay and statutory sick pay and maternity pay, all the other, all the other benefits that we pay on behalf of the government and all the other taxes that we collect on behalf of the government. Now we're, we've got into uh, a, a pension administrator, you know, working out how much to deduct and then, and also making your own contribution on behalf of the pension. So these pay slips, they've got about 12 line items on them now. I'm going to have to seriously think about subcontracting the payroll. Because I think that to run a payroll system, you need to be a payroll administrator, you know, you can't. And it's just a bridge too far. I can't be a dentist and IT support and uh, HR support and uh, fixed leaks and technical support, you know, and a plumber, an electrician, a security consultant, a CCTV administrator, 
I just can't uh, add in pension payroll administrator onto this. Just it's just a straw that broke the camel's back. Anyway, as I say, it's only thirty quid, and uh, we'll have to we'll have to um, we'll have to let it go. I don't know. What do you do with these things? You just don't sweat the small stuff, do you? You've got to, you know. There's no point in getting yourself wound up about what are basically other people's failings, other people's failure to realise that uh, becoming a small businessman is intolerable. Just do your best. Nobody can, nobody can say you did, you know, anything less than you could if you did your best. And. Uh, And certainly you shouldn't criticise yourself if you're doing your best. I said I'd follow up about this guy who came in yesterday, the one who uh, you know came in and said that his tooth was fine until he touched it with his tongue. I mean, it turns out the nerve is dying off, and it turned out that antibiotics was the, uh, under the circumstances, was the best uh, course of action because this tooth was probably hyperemic. And, uh, and he said, like, is there a good reason to delay this treatment? when I said I was going to give him antibiotics and I said yeah I said I, I'll give you an injection but as soon as I stick the drill on the tooth I said that ceiling there is, uh, is solid steel I said but you'd go straight through it and we'd have to collect you from the offices above see humour, use the humour, bit of humour to lighten the situation so anyway he, but he wants to have the tooth out and uh, this conversation it goes two different ways, depending on whether the patient's in pain. If the patient's in pain and you say, do you want to keep the tooth or take it out? Then they'll say, T I want to take it out. But you say, well, no, but I'm assuming that we can get rid of the pain and you can keep the tooth. Do you want that or do you want to take it out? And they will still say, no, take it out. No, take it out. Whereas if the patient's not in pain, right? And they've got the same problem, non-vital tooth, and you say, do you want to keep it or take it out? They'll say, I'd like to try and keep it if I can. And it's exactly the same situation, same tooth, same options, same outcomes, two completely different decisions. And so you have to, before, before a patient can make any decision about whether or not to have a tooth out, you have to get them out of pain. Because they can't make a decision while they're in pain. Or, or more likely they'll make the wrong decision. So, the rule of thumb really with that sort of situation is that if they're not in pain, then you can put the question to them, can't you? And say, do you want to keep it or take it out? And then just accept the answer. I'm not saying they should always want to keep it. They might want to take it out. If they say, no, I thought about it, Mr. Watson, and I want to take it out, then take it out. It's non-vital, it's likely to blow up, it's a reasonable course of action, take it out. However, if they're in pain, I think at that point I would discuss their options with them and say, look, these are going to be your two options to either try and save it or take it out. And they'd say, oh, well, I don't need to worry about that. So I've already decided I'm gonna have it taken out. And so I'm like, right, okay. As I said, that is one of your, that will be one of your options. So but I have, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get you out of pain first and then, if you want me to take it out, I will. However, up until the point <laughs> that I put the forceps on the tooth, you can change your mind and decide that you might want to try and keep it. In which case, you've still got, you've got the choice. You haven't made the choice. When you're in pain, they, you're not asked to make the decision. I don't ask you to make the decision. All I do is I'll tell you what your options are. When we get you out of pain, then you can make the choice. And you know what? Nine times out of ten, they decide to keep it. And do you know how that they? Do you know how they know? How you know that they've decided to keep it when they say, "Well, how much is it? How much would it cost if to retreat it?" And then, and you can say like four hundred quid or something. And you know, you've got to say four hundred quid. Say, so say it's a molar root treatment. I did a molar root treatment yesterday on a guy who has had a had an infection on the tooth, a suppurating gum boil, for as far as we can 
work out more than 15 years, right? In fact, so long, he's got this sort of osteoclastic root shortening. So you've got these sort of very short, dumb, blunt shaped roots, you know, that, that, that show that they're resorbing due to the chronic infection over the decades. And uh, the first indication we had of this, believe it or not, was when we did the uh, electronic um, apex locator. And we found that the distal roots were 16 millimeters long. And I double checked it and there were two of them and sure enough, they were both 16 millimeters long. So, you know, and you always trust the uh, apex locator. Never, never ever think to yourself, well, actually that's, that's, that can't be right. I'm going to go up to 20 and test them again. Don't do that. Just trust your apex locator. In fact, if you are using your apex locator correctly, you should be able to twist it slightly and move it 0.1 of a millimetre up or down and the, the display should change. In other words, you should be able to move it and see the display change in real time to mirror what you're doing. If, you're, if, you're, if you can do that, then that display is accurate. Don't, don't uh, you know, muck about with it, just do it. Even if the route looks longer, it may be that the root canal comes out the side of the root. It doesn't come out of the, of the tip, and so it will still be accurate. The, the apex locator will still be trying to tell you that you shouldn't go to the whole length of the root, that it, it exits at the side, and that's all that needs to be filled. Anyway, we did a fantastic um, root filling on this guy. Two 16 millimeter distal roots, and I think two eight, an 18 and an 18 and a half medial roots. And uh, and I think we've probably saved this tooth. You know that infection now will go away. He's gone. We've he's had a period with some cresophene inside the tooth. The gum bar's already gone away. Um, and the um, and I think that probably that bone will reform around that tooth, and it will just always have short roots. But but long enough to support a crown, you know. And then, uh, last but not least, is another woman in yesterday who, again, upper right uh, four, two canals, much longer this time, sort of 22 and a half mil, but um, came in with the most nebulous complaint originally, only really found out what the problem was by pulp testing the teeth uh, with, a, with an electronic pulp tester. And, um, and sure enough, the upper right four was, was dead as a dodo, so uh, whipped it open, and then and then she came in and she said, oh, I'm still getting all this trouble, I'm still getting all this trouble. And it turned out that, yes, she had been fine for a couple of days, and then it had blown up again, and, um, and, but, and she'd taken some paracetamol, but then she said, I went to see a homeopathic friend of mine who recommended uh, St. John's Wort. So I've been, the last sort of few days, I've been taking St. John's Wort. And you're like, okay, so not so painful then, you know, not, not, not as painful as it was when you needed to take paracetamol and ibuprofen. Uh, but the point is this woman, you know, she was still, she was convinced that something was wrong and it was all going wrong. And whereas in fact, on the face of it, symptomatically, uh, although she had had a, a flare up, I mean, possibly because we pushed a few bacteria through the tip of the root, or it was a particularly severe infection, or, or something. Um, and, and things were tangibly getting better because I asked her on a pain scale of nine, you know, she was not, she said she was nine out of ten on the three days after the, the treatment, but now it was like about a five, and she was on a St. John's wart. And I said to her, Look, we've just got to get this finished and then get and then give it plenty of time to settle down. By which I mean up to two years. <laughs> My wife had a root treatment that took, that not done by me, I might add, but done by a specialist endodontist. Then she was complaining that it felt odd and different and strange and not right for two years afterwards. But was x-rayed, you know, more than once and was obviously, technically, was a, was a nice job on x-ray, you know, it was when all the, filled up to the roots and everything. So did a lot of root treatments yesterday. If you're going to buy a couple of bits of kit, I would say electronic pulp tester, 
and uh, an, an apex locator. I might put links in the show notes to the two that I use. I'm not recommending that you buy them because the chances are they're, <laughs> they're more. Tony Reid would not approve of them. They're probably, I don't know if they're CE marked and uh, I don't know if they're uh, approved by the BDIA or whatever. And they're probably not available through BDIA suppliers. Surprise, surprise. But um, they do work, you know, that's the main thing. I found them to be very reliable and uh, and in, in particular, the Apex Locator, brilliant, you know, I mean, really does a brilliant job, you know. It's very, very accurate and very responsive. So, perhaps I'll get sponsored by the little Chinese children that make it. Okay, lovely to talk to you. I'll, uh, I'll talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.